More than half the world's population today derives between 5% and 40% of their genomes from a ghost group we only recognized after sequencing a 24,000 year old Siberian boy. Since then, each new study has raised more questions than answers. In Libya's Takakori Caves, DNA extracted from 9,000-year-old human remains revealed a lineage unrelated to any living African or Eurasian group. High-resolution sequencing showed these people carried genetic variants absent from every population on Earth today. In the late 1920s, Soviet archaeologist Mikhail Gerasimov began excavating the Maltabure camps on Lake Baikal, excavating a semi-subterranean villages built from mammoth bones and reindeer antler, roofed with animal skins to ward off the Siberian cold. His teams recovered over 800 carved ivory and bone objects, Venus figures in detailed hoods, bird sculptures, and mammoth tusk plates with geometric designs. This is evidence of an ancient tradition and culture far beyond mere survival. Decades later, when researchers finally decoded the genome of the Malta child, they uncovered something astonishing, that between 5 and 40% of modern Europeans and Native Americans trace their ancestry to this long-lost population. Coalescent models show that the Malta population's genetic lineage split from the ancestors of all other Homo sapiens around 40,000 to 50,000 years ago. This doesn't mean the Malta people were isolated for millennia, but their DNA reveals a distinct branch of our species story. We are not the outbreak of a single diaspora fading all else in its path. We are the product of many lineages, some of which vanished entirely. If one genome from a Siberian child can change the scientific consensus that our ancestors came from at least one other human branch, then every other buried genome or hidden fossil suddenly becomes a potential revolver pointed at our origin myths. This leads us to the Tadra Akarkas Mountains, which were once part of a green Sahara around 8,250 BC. In the Tadra Akarkas of Libya, two women were buried between around 5,200 BC and 4,300 BC. When scientists sequenced their DNA, they found a completely unique North African lineage one that split from the ancestors of non-African populations at the time of the original out-of-Africa migration around 60,000 years ago, and then survived through the Sahara's wet green phase before vanishing again. At first glance, their burials look like any other early pastoralist site, but when Nader Salem's team sequenced their genomes, the results didn't fit. These Takakori herders carried a North African ancestry component so distinct it remained unchanged through the Green Sahara before disappearing once more. Even stranger, they show just 0.15% Neanderthal DNA 10 times less than Levantine farmers and far above the 0% of most Sub-Saharan Africans. What does this tell us? a community with only the slightest mix of outside genes. Their closest genetic cousins come from the Epipaleolithic foragers of Tafarolt Cave in Morocco, but even that link is faint, which shows how uniquely isolated the Takakori people were. What forced these people into oblivion, the climate that turned grasslands to desert, or newcomers who replaced them? And if Africa hid this branch for millennia, what other lost peoples are buried under shifting dunes, alpine ice, or arctic permafrost, waiting to rewrite our origin story? Takakori's story shows us that Africa wasn't one melting pot population, but a mosaic of peoples whose lives and legacies can disappear without warning. That fragility is a real lesson. Every community we fail to remember is one fewer piece in our puzzle of identity and one more victory for the forces that prefer a simple, single-threaded past. In September 1991, high in the Ötztal Alps, on the border of Austria and Italy, 
hikers stumbled upon the naturally mummified body of a man, later named Ertzi, preserved in ice for over 5,000 years. Genetic analyses have since revealed that his Y-chromosome haplogroup was G2A2B and his mitochondrial haplogroup was K1O, both rare or extinct in Europe today. The really strange thing about this is the whole genome sequencing shows that Otzi carried no step ancestry, none at all, the hallmark of later Bronze Age migrations, and instead his autosomal profile clusters closest with early Neolithic farmers from Anatolia and the Aegean, yet still distinct enough to represent a lineage now vanished from the modern gene pool. Even more bizarre, runs of homozygosity in Utzi's genome meant his community was small and isolated, with an effective population size estimated at just a few hundred individuals. That isolation, combined with his unique haplogroups, means that the alpine farmers of 3300 BCE worked and died in villages whose descendants were later replaced or mixed with other tribes, leaving Ertzi as one of the last of his kind. What forced this alpine lineage into oblivion? Was it the influx of Yamnaya-derived steppe pastoralists during the Bronze Age, or did environmental shifts and epidemic waves gradually erode these early farming communities? If a people who once lived on these slopes could vanish so completely, what other mountain-dwelling or valley-dwelling populations have not been discovered and could give us a whole new branch of our history? Otzi's story is important because it brings the tangled forest thesis right into our backyard, showing that even in well-studied Europe, whole farming communities rose, thrived and then disappeared without leaving a modern trace. Think about it. We've dug up Otzi's well-preserved body, sequenced his genome end to end and discovered an alpine lineage that carried no steppe ancestry at all, yet clustered with Aegean farmers and then vanished. His world wasn't some isolated backwater. It was connected to wider Neolithic networks, and still it was erased. That erasure cuts to the heart of our video's point. Every time a buried genome like Malta or Takarkori or Otzi surfaces, it reminds us how fragile and fleeting human lineages can be. If a community that tilled the Alps 5,300 years ago can slip entirely out of the modern gene pool, what hope do less preserved groups have? Most archaeological sites, Egypt's Valley of the Kings, Peru's Inca citadels, Europe's cave complexes, welcome researchers with permits, but Antarctica, governed by the 1959 Antarctic Treaty and its 1991 Environmental Protocol, is largely inaccessible without state backing. Why would rival nations, usually eager for resources, lock down a shared continent unless more than conservation is at stake. Consider Operation High Jump. Admiral Richard Byrd led 4,700 personnel, 13 ships and 33 aircraft into the Ross Sea, mapping uncharted regions down to 87 degrees south, collecting ice cores, aerial photographs and geological samples on an unprecedented scale. The mission ended abruptly as the Antarctic winter approached. While most findings, charts, photos, weather data were published, its strategic objectives, tied to Cold War territorial claims, were initially classified, prompting questions about what the Navy sought beneath the ice. Beneath Antarctica's ice, up to 4.8 kilometers thick, geothermal heat from the Earth's crust creates hidden caves and rivers with temperatures reaching 25 degrees Celsius, 77 degrees Fahrenheit, near volcanic sites like Mount Erebus. Studies since 2014 show these subglacial cavities may harbor microbial ecosystems or fossils from Gondwana's ancient ecosystems, millions of years old. For example, a 2015 study at subglacial Lake Willens published in Science Advances by Fischer et al. 
measured heat flux at 285 plus or minus 80 milliwatts per square meter, nearly three times the global average, indicating a Yellowstone-like hotspot that could support life. A 2017 polar biology study by Connell et al. found DNA of unidentified mosses, algae, and arthropods in Erebus caves, suggesting unknown species thrive in these warm oases. Yet, the 1959 Antarctic Treaty's strict rules requiring permits and environmental assessments for drilling keep these sites off-limits except to government-backed teams. Why such tight control over a frozen wasteland, like the buried genomes of the Malta Child or Otzi's farmers, these subglacial caves, vaults of Earth's ancient secrets, remain out of reach, reserved for those with elite clearance? Why did some humans carry a hidden asset that let them conquer the highest peaks? And what does that say about the rest of us? Tibet's 5,000-meter plateaus, where air is thin and storms can kill in minutes, yet local herders and mountaineers thrive there. And it comes down to one tiny tweak in their DNA. The EPAS, one gene variant inherited from Denisovans 40,000 years ago, rewrote their physiology higher haemoglobin efficiency, better oxygen use, resistance to chronic mountain sickness. This isn't marginal. Tibetans carry up to 80% of this Denisovan-derived allele, while it's nearly non-existent elsewhere in the world. It's as if an ancient Arctic cousin planted a survival kit in their genome, creating high-altitude empire building from the Himalayas to the Andes. But the strange thing is that other high-altitude peoples, like the Andeans, survived without this EPAS-1 boost, evolving different solutions. And yet, in every case, these genetic handoffs changed how societies formed. Who could herd yaks? Who could mine tin? Who could hold mountain passes? If a single allele from a ghost lineage remade human destiny on the world's extremes, what other genetic master traits lie hidden in our DNA, waiting to rewrite the story of who we are and where we can go? Among the Andaman Islands, North Sentinel Island has a unique human history with no peer-reviewed contact since the 1800s. Estimates place the Sentinelese at just 50 to 250 individuals living in small family bands along the island's beaches and mangroves. They speak a language unrelated to any other Andamanese tongue. No visitor has ever deciphered more than a handful of words, and they rely entirely on spears, bows, and dugout canoes to fish, hunt wild pigs, and collect coconuts. Their shelters are simple palm-thatched huts, abandoned and rebuilt as they move seasonally through the forest interior. Repeated attempts at contact from colonial surveys in the 19th century to the tragic 2018 missionary incursion ended in arrows and threats, teaching the outside world a painful lesson in respect. To protect their health and autonomy, India's 1956 Andaman and Nicobar Islands Protection of Aboriginal Tribes Regulation Bars any approach within five nautical miles of Sentinel Island. In doing so, it preserves one of the world's last unadmixed human lineages, living proof of hunter-gatherer lifeways that once prevailed across South and Southeast Asia. Turn south to New Guinea's central highlands, rugged plateaus rising above 2,000 meters, home to millions speaking over 800 Papuan languages and maintaining agricultural traditions older than most civilizations. Archaeologists have confirmed human settlement here as early as 49,000 to 44,000 years ago, with evidence of taro and banana cultivation by 7,000 BCE. Today's highland tribes, such as the Huli and Enga, live in earthen thatch villages, raise pigs in ceremonial exchanges, and cultivate sweet potato terraces passed down for generations. Genomic analyses place Highlanders in a unique cluster, with 4-7% Denisovan ancestry and minimal admixture from coastal or Asian populations, 
the DNA preserves adaptations to mountain hypoxia and ancient dietary practices, from root crops to wild greens, unbroken for tens of millennia. Yet modern threats, logging roads, mine projects and expanding plantations now encroach on ancestral lands, risking not only ecological damage but the loss of these living time capsules of human evolution. These uncontacted and highland peoples aren't just intriguing. Every unique lineage and culture is a valuable asset now at risk of being erased by outside forces. The Sentinelese and PNG Highlanders have preserved genetic adaptations and traditions unchanged for tens of thousands of years, yet they face the same threats of bureaucratic control, land grabs and cultural dilution that are dismantling other ancestral ties worldwide. Just as ancient treaties and Cold War politics keep Antarctica's secrets locked away, modern development projects, legal regimes and well-meaning protection laws can strip these tribes of their autonomy, wiping out living chapters of our species' tangled forest. Don't buy the story that we're all copies of a single origin, whether it's the Out of Africa script or a tidy theological narrative. Our identities were hammered out over hundreds of thousands of years through ghost lineage genomes, vanished Saharan tribes, alpine farmers erased by Bronze Age waves, secret genes from Denisovan cousins, and living time capsules like the Sentinelese and New Guinea Highlanders. If we lose even one branch of this tangled forest through indifference, politics, or profiteering, its lessons disappear forever and with them a part of who we are. Saying that, I think the most important fact that will bring understanding and peace to everyone is that we are not all the same.